Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Imperiled Sea Combating Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia webinar. Uh, my name is Kent Doty. I'm the Coastal Conservation Coordinator for the Audubon Society of Lincoln City, who is hosting tonight's webinar. Uh, Audubon Society of Lincoln City has been serving Lincoln and Tillamook County since 2006. Our core programs are education, community science, conservation action. We also offer events including birds, bird walks and the webinars like this one, all COVID responsive. Conservation focus areas for Lincoln City Audubon include forest practices, rocky habitats, marine reserves, water quality, threats to birds and wildlife, all viewed through the lens of climate change. Learn more about us at lincolncityaudubon.org. Oregon Community College is the co-host for tonight's program. They have been serving Lincoln City, Lincoln County for 35 years with healthcare, aquarium science, business, and teaching degrees, as well as certificates in early childhood education and welding and much more. Check out the college's curriculum and offerings at the OregonCoast.edu. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and I will be sending out a link uh, where it's posted on the web afterwards. So our speaker uh, this evening is Dr. Charlotte Whitefield. She works for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife as the first dedicated ocean acidification and hypoxia, or short OAH, staff member, supporting the state's OAH council for the past four years. Before coming to ODFW, Charlotte was a NOAA NOS fellow in Washington, DC, working for Senator Murkowski on her Oceans Caucus, Arctic Caucus, and Oceans Acidification initiatives. Charlotte received her master's degree at the University of New England, Maine, and her PhD at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where she studied sea cucumber aquaculture. So this is a one-hour program, and including a question and answer following uh, the presentation. During the presentation, you are encouraged to put your questions in the chat at the that you'll find at the bottom of the screen. And following the uh, following the presentation, I'll I'll respond. Will Charlotte will respond to chat questions as well as we'll have uh, people speak in hand raising. Please do keep muted during the presentation, and all questions and comments will be follow, taken following the presentation. Um, with that, I won't waste uh, any more time, and we'll give a warm welcome to Charlotte. Thank you so much for having me here. Let me see if I'm able to share my screen and get us started. Are you able to see my first slide? Excellent. So thank you so much for providing me this opportunity to join you tonight. And hopefully um, we'll spend our time basically walking through a series of different steps that the state of Oregon has taken over the past, goodness, over a decade, kind of looking forward, but looking back at how do we address ocean acidification and hypoxia, what does it mean to Oregon and what do we wanna do in the future? So um, kind of to build off the introduction that I've already received, I'm Dr. Charlotte Whitefield. Um, I work at Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and for the past four years, I have been their dedicated ocean acidification and hypoxia policy coordinator. I'm actually now transitioning onto a new role uh, at ODFW being the Oregon Conservation Recreation Fund coordinator but I am very happy to be here today and to share some more ocean information with you all. So I wanna first start out with just a very brief primer of changing ocean conditions. And really the highlight of this whole um, conversation and this really the emphasis of today is to really think about how is climate change affecting our oceans? And at the end of the day, it really comes down to carbon dioxide or CO2 emissions. These CO2 emissions are entering our ocean and really affecting it in three core tenets. It's increasing the temperature of the water, it's decreasing the oxygen, and it's really making it more acidic. And these three main changes in the chemical and physical properties of the ocean are having a cascading effect across all aspects of our ocean ecosystems and habitats, affecting sea level rise, in warmer areas, coral bleaching, uh, toxic algae blooms, changing in habitat, and obviously ocean acidification, in addition to disruptions of fisheries. And I'll go through many of those today. 
So the underlying problem, this is very a basic schematic, but the information presented here is based on data from the West Coast and within the last decade. But what I really want to stress is that atmospheric carbon dioxide is increasing at rapid rates. And this increasing carbon dioxide is changing the atmospheric temperature, air temperature is rising. This is in turn increasing sea surface and deeper level ocean temperatures. This change in temperature, in addition to the increase in carbon dioxide that does get absorbed into the ocean water, is changing not only ocean acidity or ocean acidification or the pH of the ocean, but it's also changing the amount of oxygen available in the ocean. And these changes in ocean acidification and hypoxia or that oxygen within the ocean um, really varies as you get um, further away from the coast and varies also with depth. But one thing to really highlight here is that Oregon and the West Coast of the United States really is a pivotal area of the world and especially of the United States seeing the direct impacts of ocean acidification on hypoxia. Oregon and specifically the Whiskey Creek shellfish hatchery in the 2006, 2007 was the first place in the world to see the direct tangible impacts of ocean acidification on our ecosystem and our economics, specifically through Whiskey Creek shellfish hatchery and the dissolution or basically breaking down of baby oyster shells within that hatchery. This was the first time that we were able, we as scientists, managers, industry members, able to link the effects of ocean acidification or that change in pH in aragonite, and I'll get into that a little bit more in future slides, impacts on to shell formation and really start this ball rolling of understanding. But really why is Oregon um, and the West Coast kind of that pivotal place? And really it comes down to climate change and our unique coastal upwelling. So you can see in this schematic really seasonal coastal upwelling of old acidified low oxygen waters combined with changes in our wind circulation, amplification from run land runoff and increasing carbon dioxide and that solar warming is really just a hotbed for ocean change here. And really on a very, very basic level, what this means is ecosystem and habitat scale impacts across our Oregon shelf and across our ocean system, regardless of where in the water column you are. This impacts traditional pteropods or sea butterflies, shells. So these are small little um, snail-like organisms that float through the water, impacts fish's sense of smell, where they happen to be in the water column, all the way down to the traditional impacts on oysters, urchins, and also um, mussels. So what is ocean acidification? This is a very simplistic um, kind of diagram of the chemistry of ocean acidification. There's a few things I really want you to really pick up here. Carbon dioxide is increasing. This through a series of chemical reactions with water in the ocean is increasing the hydrogen ions. And that increase of hydrogen ions on a simplistic level decreases ocean's pH. It's important to realize that the ocean is not going to be acidic. It's just becoming more acidic. And that is something very important to think about. And also carbonate ions are those um, very simple building blocks of most uh, shells within the ocean. And what does this mean? And basically just this means that the ocean is becoming once again more acidic and very much going from a pH of a 8.2 to a pH of 8.1. But once again, it's logarithmic. So that is a very large drop. So how do we know that ocean acidification is changing? Um, we as scientists and managers do have some very good data sets that are out there. And what you can see on your screen right now is a data set from Hawaii, obviously not Oregon, but this is one of the longest um, data streams that we have showing the direct impacts of atmospheric CO2 in modern times, starting in roughly 1958 to present going up. And that is what you can see on your axis. Hopefully you can see my cursor uh, right over here, carbon dioxide levels. And then also, and that's in red. Then what you can see in green is uh, PCO2 or the carbon dioxide that is within the ocean water itself. And also um, pH, which you can see in blue. 
So what I want you to really grasp from here is that although there's a lot of variability within that green line, which is due to um, biological impacts, that line is correlating with atmospheric CO2 increasing, and there's a direct correlation with decrease in pH. What does this actually mean for the organisms? So pH in and of itself is one of the main measures of ocean acidification, but there's also several others. So ocean acidification is also measured by aragonite or uh, omega basically, which is the units that it's measured in. What you can see here is surface and deeper water off the coast of Oregon. And what I want you to really see is that if you see areas that are red, in the darker reds, these are areas that really aren't good for uh, pteropod shells as they are currently. Areas up in the blue, roughly around the three, mostly uh, sustain healthy animals of pteropods. Um, obviously the Columbia River plume aside, since that's a freshwater source and really does impact the aragonite levels, um, a lot of the coast of Oregon is already not very suitable for these animals where traditionally it had been. So as we increase ocean acidification, this is really a huge issue for um, pteropods. And just as a reminder, pteropods are one of the main food sources for many different species of salmon. So this is very important for our food webs here. So moving forward, also uh, ocean acidification is usually coupled with ocean hypoxia. What you can see here is just a basic schematic of what happens on the west coast of uh, Oregon West Coast of the United States, specifically Oregon, when it deals with um, hypoxia. So hypoxia levels are when the ocean oxygen drops to a level of 1.4 milliliters uh, per liter. And that really is detrimental for many different organisms. And we can see that in the next slide. Here, basically it's showing that coastal upwelling uh, really brings that low, uh, low oxygen, high uh, DIC, dissolved inorganic carbon, high nutrient water to the surface combined with the fact it's already very low in oxygen, when it combines with phytoplankton blooms, they rapidly grow, rapidly die, and suck up even more oxygen as they break down with um, a bacterial decomposition. So really, uh, Oregon is a hotbed for hypoxia and is ever more increasing due to this changing uh, conditions. So what are oxygen levels important, or what oxygen levels are important for uh, most animals along the Oregon coast. You can see here that going from basically 100% saturation to zero, there's varying degrees of what usually happens as you decrease. First of all, it tends to affect behavior, then it tends to affect basically presence absence. So not only are the animals first slower, then they just basically leave an area down into these lower areas below this hypoxic level, which is the 1.4, where animals really start to rapidly die and for lack of a better phrase, suffocate. So ocean hypoxia is extremely um, detrimental for Oregon's coast. And as many of you most likely have already heard um, through the news and other outlets, uh, it is becoming ever more increasing along the Oregon coast. Here you can see, once again, just a data set to help show this. This is data from PISCO, which is a long-term data set along the West Coast. There's many monitoring sites here in Oregon with uh, researchers from Oregon State University. And what I wanna show is that the black line is basically a long-term uh, mean for these months from March to September. The gray line is basically standard deviation. What is the variability around that? And the red is 2020 data. And really important to note here is that uh, 2020, 2021 really have ex seen very, very extreme and very prolonged uh, hypoxic conditions, specifically in the Cape Perpetua area, which is obviously um, extremely vibrant uh, ecosystem and also um, one of very close to some of our marine reserves areas and some of the monitoring sites. So extremely important to really think about. So moving forward to local impacts. Well, you can see here, this is data from a researcher um, based out of California. And what I really wanna show here is just the basic schematic. These are different um, areas along uh, Washington, Oregon, and California. And what is being shown here are the relative impacts of revenue, income, and employment based on 
uh, current and foreseen impacts from ocean acidification. Red denotes that the these different uh, metrics of uh, economic system are going to be impacted, where blue would mean that they would be positively impacted, red means negatively. Important to note that most, it, basically the entire West Coast that's been measured, grayer data that they don't have necessarily, or a net neutral impact are going to be negatively impacted. And really importantly, um, Northern Oregon, the Astoria region and that Tillamook region will be extremely impacted because that's where our um, aquaculture for the state of Oregon really is. Once again, this is just another schematic to really think about it. Um, once again, color code blue would be positive, red is negative. Uh, the numbers denote the specific size effect. Happy to provide this uh, paper if anyone's interested. And they looked across different um, industries in Oregon, including fishing and aquaculture. And here, once again, um, Dungeness crab is going to be extremely impacted. Interestingly enough, they're not sure if shrimp will be impacted. It seems to be positive, but that nuance within the paper, there are some other compounding factors. But we do expect that on a physiological um, scale, shrimp will be um, at some point impacted by ocean acidification. And really to drive home, why is this so important? Um, although aquaculture for the state of Oregon isn't necessarily as big as other regions, such as Washington State or areas of the East Coast, it's still huge for the state of Oregon. Pacific oyster culture brings in multi-million dollars. In addition, um, pink shrimp, Dungeness crabs, salmon, ground fish, um, all will be impacted by ocean acidification hypoxia. Pink shrimp and Dungeness crab more potentially due to ocean acidification and that degradation of their hard shells. But at the same time, salmon will be impacted through pteropods and that food source and ground fish are greatly impacted by hypoxia. And we've already seen shifts in uh, the positioning of rockfish and also halibut as a result of hypoxic zones. So the direct impacts on not only Oregon's ecosystem, but our economics will be huge and have already been impacted. Just to kind of emphasize, this is not just being seen within our scientific and our um, seafood industry. This has really been picked up and noticed by the general public, using that term very loosely, but our traditional news outlets. So once again, starting in kind of the 2006-7, fast forwarding 2010, um, the Whiskey Creek shellfish hatchery story made national news. And then once again in 2020, there is a new study that came out of Washington State on the impacts of ocean acidification on Dungeness crab larvae from actually within the ocean. So these are very real, very tangible for the general Oregonian. Also, low oxygen zones have been observed off the coast starting around the same time of 2007. And in 2021, this has been huge impact with some of our uh, crab fleets. And what you can see here is this even spurred a new study where um, Oregon State University partnered with many of our Oregon crabbing fleet to put hypoxic sensors, you can see that with that orange blob right in the center, in crab pots. We can monitor this in situ as a result of these direct observations. So really to build on regional awareness, I first talked about the science of what's going on, then the impacts on the ecosystem and Oregon's economy, but really it's time to think about what are we going to do and what does this mean on a global scale? So once again, ocean acidification hypoxia really is a manifestation of carbon dioxide and is amplified by many different anthropogenic or human-based sources of pollution or impact. So once again, storm runoff, fertilizer, um, other pollutants within the air, even soil erosion and runoff from our streets combined with natural upwelling systems can really impact how ocean acidification hypoxia manifests itself. And all of these things really do drive increased duration and magnitude of ocean acidification and hypoxia. So this is just kind of to um, bring out the lens even further and make sure that everyone on this call realizes that ocean acidification hypoxia is not just an Oregon issue, although we were one of the first to really see it, to quantify it and to understand it, 
um, an ecosystem and a social level, this is happening globally. Once again, aragonite is a carbonate ion. This is the once again what is used for the shell formation of many of our um, shelled organisms, bivalves and um, different things like that. And what I'm showing here is information from uh, actually that was printed by uh, the UN as part of their uh, climate change policies. And these are model predictions under scenario 8.5, which is basically um, business as usual. We do not change our, our carbon emissions. What you can see in this model run is that between 1850 and 1860, pre-industrial revolution to uh, uh, two or 2100, which is not that far off, honestly, um, you can see that the aragonite saturation level is going to be very, very detrimental along almost the entire coast of Oregon. As I showed earlier, there are impacts now, but this is going to be like not just seasonal, this is annual averages where it's going to be almost always corrosive potentially if things don't change. And once again, this is just pH kind of showing us similar trend pre-industrial revolution to um, a similar time frame, not in the far distant future, where um, there is potential that our oceans will drop to about a 7.1. If you remember your pH scales, um, that is hypothetically neutral, but that is more acidic, and that is where it becomes an issue. And once again, this is an interesting graph. Um, it is modeled, resolution is quite poor. That's why you can see so much uh, white along the coasts of different areas. But what I want to stress here is really the idea that um, it's showing the time frame when ocean um, deoxygenation, basically ocean hypoxia, uh, will occur due to climate change. Ocean hypoxia can happen due to many different factors, including uh, eutrophication or the increase of um, nutrients from farming. That's normally what is occurring in parts of the East Coast and the Gulf of Mexico. It's important to note that here in Oregon, although we do have uh, issues in certain areas with land runoff of nutrients, our primary driver of hypoxia is not necessarily land nutrients like the Gulf of Mexico. They impact, like I showed earlier, but they are not the driver. So what you can see here is that along the coast of um, Washington, uh, Oregon, and Northern California, um, although we are seeing seasonal impacts of hypoxia, this is really saying that we're going to see extensive impacts of hypoxia along our coast. So once again, a curious study, happy to share it. Um, Poor resolution, but it is something to think about that um, this is really going to be important for Oregon, potentially more than other areas of the world, although this problem will be occurring across our globe. So what are we doing about this? So to kind of think about this on a global level, I first want to kind of think about setting the stage of action and what are some of the large scale things that we're doing and then getting into some of the small scale things that Oregon specifically is doing. So one group I do want to kind of think about and draw your attention to is the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification. And Oregon is actually a founding member of this group, interestingly enough. Oregon is um, on their board of directors, but the country of the United States is not actually a member nor on their board of directors. So Oregon sits alongside the nations of France, Chile, and New Zealand, but also alongside our partners of Washington State and California. So it's a very interesting group. And really they focus on this very important concept of advancing science, reducing causes, exploring adaptation mitigation, expanding public awareness and building sustained international support. And you'll see those themes across um, many of the slides that I'll be discussing. So this International Alliance to Combat OAH really spurred out of the Pacific Coast Collaborative, which is the partnership of Oregon, Washington, California, and um, British, the province of British Columbia. And this is really a governor level agreement of binding climate change and ocean change action, really to convene science, to build up the OA Alliance, and to really think about what do we do on a regional scale 
the mileage of coastline that these jurisdictions protect is enormous. And although not listed, Alaska has been a on and again, off again partner in many of these things. So with them um, joining some of the agreements, the coastline is enormous that the, um, these jurisdictions can help protect. So one of the most tangible things that they've actually done together is starting the state province federal OEH monitoring inventory. And what you can see here on the dots is the dots and the lines indicate all the places we know we've collected data. Um, this inventory was done in 2016 to 18, so it includes everything prior to that. Uh, it does need to be updated and it is accessible on Manu, so you can see and play with all these points. But it's important to know that we, it looks like we have very good coverage, and we do to a certain extent. And if you kind of zoom into Oregon, you can see once again, there's biological, physical, and geochemical data on many parts of the Oregon coast. The different colors represent types of data collected. But the thing to really think about is this panel that you can see over here where my cursor is, and these are active sites. There's only 16 active sites. The rest of these are very much historic. And that's critical when you think on to monitoring and state action now of what can we do and how do we move that needle when we don't have current data everywhere. So that is really kind of the crux of some of the next things that I'm going to be talking about. So Oregon actions, what are we doing? How do we move on the science, our understanding of the ecosystem and the economy, state, regional, and uh, international efforts. How does Oregon become a player? So this is really a basic um, timeline that you can see, and I'm happy to share these slides so you can get into a little bit more detail. A high level, it's important to think we started in 2007 really with um, the failure of Whiskey Creek shellfish hatchery, the first observations of ocean acidification and hypoxia impacts, formation of the Pacific Coast Collaborative, and then moving forward, building on regional, state, and federal actions, as you can see here. And these actions really went into the two buckets of purple policy and management and green research and monitoring. And they have really been building. Obviously, this graph needs to be updated since you can see it starts to trail off in 2020, and it's obviously 2022 now. But these um, actions have not only just built, but they are really kind of um, moving forward, and we'll talk about that. So to think about it first, um, really state actions started in 2017 specifically with um, a legislative freely created bill, Senate Bill 260. And this is important to think about. This is the first legislatively mandated ocean acidification or ocean acidification hypoxia council nationwide. This bill passed with bipartisan support. There was roughly five people out of both chambers that either were absent for the vote or voted no. So if you think fast forward to modern times with most climate change action, um, that's huge. There was very strong bipartisan support for this. And this bill not only created the OEH Council, which we'll get into in a second, but it gave it no fun or no sunset. And what I mean by that is it didn't end the group. There was no, this group ends this date. That's critical because it acknowledged that this would be a growing problem. It provided funding, huge, minimal funding. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, but it's still funding and continuous funding. And it not only had legislative support, but it had governor support. Um, this group is not regulatory. There is no ability for the OAH Council to make new regulations, but they can strongly make recommendations. And those recommendations have been picked up amongst our uh, partner agencies and different groups. So you can see here the vast group of different individuals that have served on this group, including myself. Um, some are interns, other staff members. We've had 22 members, but the active seats on the council are uh, 13 includes um, academics, state agencies, fishing and shellfish representatives, tribal representatives, NGOs, um, a wide group of individuals, also the Ocean Science Trust. And this group really came together under the preface of these six main mandates. And this really is to acknowledge CO2 is the problem, and this is where the state needs to make action. Benefits need to be for humans and ecosystems because there's that connection. Things need to be Oregon focused as we've seen before. 
um, but really put in a global context as we've seen with these different building actions. We need to complement existing management frameworks to leverage what we have, but think towards the future. Don't be confined by where we are, but to think about how do we build to where we want to go. And that's really what this group has um, done. So starting in 2017 with that first passage of the bill, the OAH Council has been fortunate enough to do uh, two full uh, biennial reports, which are mandated by the legislature, an OAH action plan, which they've presented to the international community, including uh, the UN conferences uh, that they have attended, built a multi-agency report for OAH action, and really help spur forward um, House Bill 3114, which is a funding bill, which we'll get into shortly. So what have we done? So this is gonna be kind of the highlights, high level of uh, all of the things. You'll notice that I've been playing with numbers. It's a little bit of the OAH Council by the numbers, play off many of the C grant program um, statistics. But the OAH Council's first report was huge. It had 12 overarching recommendations with 37 specific actions and 56 report pages, in addition to countless pages of appendices helping to document their work. And this was a very huge lift. This was created within eight months. This really then spurred forward the OAH Action Plan or Oregon's commitment to the international community and our guiding framework for the next five years. Uh, the OAH Action Plan is actually up for um, kind of updates in uh, 2025. So that process will start within the next year, but really to help um, identify and focus this, the OAH um, Council spent quite a bit of time doing a community outreach interviews, one-on-one -on -one calls to very, very much get into the details of what do Oregon's, Oregonians want? What can we move the needle on? Where is there the biggest impact for Oregon? Because we need to make sure our actions are Oregon-based, but building on larger issues. So we also, so as a result of this, we made the OAH action plan. It was endorsed by the governor, submitted to the international community, and really set the groundwork of our understanding of funding and timeline needs, really kind of highlighting Oregon carbon and climate policies, actions for the future, and building sustained support across our agencies. And then really in 2020, the um, OAH Council came together again with their second biennial report and really archived what did they accomplish since their first report and where do they want to go with very clear attainable benchmarks and path for completing that work. And this work really was um, highlighted and picked up by uh, the Nationwide Association for Fish and Wildlife Agencies where the OAH Council received an award for their work. And this really um, seems a little bit like a pat on the back, and it was in a sense, but it was really recognition that this small non-regulatory group has moved the needle on ocean climate and climate change action. So we were very proud of this recognition. So Oregon implementation. So really this bucket of work that the OAH Council has been moving forward on falls into once again, these five buckets. And this should be reminiscent of what I discussed with the um, International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification. And once again, this falls into science, mitigation, adaptation, awareness, and coordination. And these do obviously cross connect. They are not siloed in any way but they do help organize action, really help organize and leverage momentum. So the first thing that is within our 2018 report, our 2019 OAH action plan in our 2020 report, in addition to what's gonna come up in 2022 as our new report um, is really science. How do we invest more in monitoring? If you think back to that um, monitoring gap study that I showed in one of the earlier slides, how do we make more long-term monitoring? How do we fill in the gaps of what was um, established in 2016 to 2018 with that first inventory? And how do we move that forward for modern and current um, regulatory actions where and how they're appropriate? So the first thing that really the OAH Council has been helping to spur forward is the Oregon um, 
OH monitoring groups, so ocean acidification monitoring group. Uh, this is a collaboration of the partners you can see here, in addition to many others. And they have banded together in different ways to really stand up new research throughout the state. And we're very proud of this group. They meet roughly quarterly and really help each other to get new OAH, ocean acidification hypoxia monitoring assets, or basically equipment like you can see in this diagram up and down the coast. Also really moving forward for our 2022 biannual report, we really wanna think about coordinating um, biological metrics really thinking about um, how do we monitor ocean acidification on hypoxia, physical chemical parameters on a biological level, like I showed earlier, and how do we feed these into ongoing state processes, such as DEQ water quality assessment, I'll show that in a minute, um, Oregon, California marine reserves assessment, and also Oregon Rocky Shores assessments. Next is really the concept of strategic um, mitigation towards carbon dioxide and other OAH stressors. And really here, the first thing that the OAH Council has really been focusing in on is assisting um, Oregon Department of Environmental Quality in their Clean Water Act monitoring. It was really critical in 2019, the state of Oregon became the first in the nation to list their coastal waters as 3B impairment for ocean acidification hypoxia. And what that means is that um, long and the short of it is that we know ocean acidification hypoxia are impacting our waters. We don't have enough data to really act on them in a regulatory manner. Although maybe not as concrete as we would have hoped as a listing under the Clean Water Act, this was huge. First state in the country to do this. And this really started a continuing collaborations across um, Oregon science community and regulatory community to really get an understanding of what data we need. And these conversations are continuing and hopefully within their 2024 reports, which is kind of a couple of years out, but it does take a lot of steps. We'll have more information to get us out of that golden, kind of the goldenrod color you can see of insufficient data into something where we actually know what's going on completely. And once again, um, really tying into other work that's being done throughout the state is really we want to tie into the blue carbon conversations, figure out how blue carbon and um, carbon sequestration within our submerged aquatic vegetations may or could be a potential mitigation source or adaptation resiliency source for um, ocean acidification hypoxia along our coast. Really tying into that is obviously this concept of theme three, which is um, adaptation and resiliency. And really, this is going to come down to all sorts of different information gathering tools, including the development of potentially fishermen's observation application. This is going to be hopefully um, an ongoing um, project of the OAH Council where they want to build a web based application for ocean users, fishers, managers, and scientists to rapidly use citizen science data to input onto an online platform to share species currents, sea surface temperatures, and other oceanographic data, how and when it's appropriate to really feed into this ongoing conversation of where and how is OAH occurring and what can we do to adapt to it. Also, there's interest in really partnering with other groups throughout the state. Um, including potentially the tourism industry and thinking about how do we message adaptation resiliency through ongoing messages that they have. Um, Oregon Coast Visitors Association is part of the Tourism Declares Climate Emergency. And this is a really cool opportunity that they've been engaging in and that um, potentially there's correspondence with OAH issues where we can think about how does OAH tie into their ongoing messaging of climate change and what can a citizen do to help? Um, conserving uh, gasoline, trying to make fewer trips, using public transportation, um, even water conservation, just things like that really do tie into these larger messages. Uh, one of my favorite buckets is really this idea of awareness and communications. How do we think about building understanding and empowerment of what is ocean acidification hypoxia, what is ocean change? What can you do about it? So not a doom and gloom, because we know this is a dire strait, but empowerment. We are in a bad situation, but you can help. 
And that is the key to this awareness, is that we acknowledge where we are and we empower to the future, because otherwise people feel paralyzed and they will not act and the situation will not get better. Um, so it's really that double-edged approach that we really are trying to move forward to. So although really not the best outreach materials that we could have had, and I'll say that because I am not only the writer, but the graphic designer, and my background is lipid chemistry. So we'll put that in this framework. But uh, we are very excited that we'll have the opportunity to work with a graphic designer to really help make these graphics move forward. But these are targeted for our region, really have the lens and the information we want, and it's a starting place. And we're excited to work with the OA Alliance to continue this local message to global impacts and really um, use our partnerships to leverage our materials collectively. And last thing I kind of want to highlight really briefly, because I am running into about question and answer time, is that this idea of um, basically coordinating our priorities and really coordinating across our agencies. The OAH Council is not regulatory, but many of our partners are. So um, in 2021, they wrote, um, we wrote a very large report where we were across the edge. Um, basically, what do different authorities do within the state? What are their regulatory powers? And where are their gaps where they think they can help get um, more information, more data, more regulations, or just more information? So even communications into the regulatory frameworks. So planning for the future. And I'll get through these slides in just a couple of minutes so we can end right at 7.15 for Q&A. Um, I really wanna end on this idea of planning for the future. What can you do? What can we do? And what can Oregon do? And this really comes back to this idea of public awareness, strategic action, and scientific understanding. Without all three of these, we will not have healthy communities and ecosystems here in Oregon. They are very, very cross connection interconnected and woven into how we move forward. And we're very excited that with House Bill 3114, uh, there was just shy of $2 million really fed into OAH strategic action within the state. Once again, a bipartisan bill passed with enormous support. Um, and this was huge. This really helped fund ODFW, OSU, in addition to some really awesome competitive grants. So this closed already, but there were seven specific competitive grants for just over a million dollars that had RFPs in 2021. And this was our first strategic funding into OAH science, um, passed the OAH Council, and really helped spur forward the Oregon Ocean Science Trust and their ongoing initiatives. So really briefly, these fell into the buckets of OAH science, there's multiple different projects with instrumentation, amplifying Newport hydrographic line, Uquina Bay, estuary assessments, a really ecosystem resiliency and economic resiliency, thinking about um, how do we do more modeling? How do we do more mapping? How do we do more best practices? So very targeted reach and outreach here. And also communications. We're gonna have a dedicated communications firm, um, one of the best in the nation that's worked with the National Zoo and Aquarium Association. Come here to Oregon and really help amplify what materials we have to really make them much more powerful for what we need. And this really also helped spur the um, boost into getting more money. They just received an additional $1 million that's going to be really for um, targeted ocean change research moving forward. So I really want to end here with this concept back to carbon emissions and where can you, as a person, as an Oregonian, past your ability to help guide policy and legislation, really think about what can you do on a personal level. So one of the things I love to think about is, um, and the easiest thing for many people to do is food waste. Think about the carbon emissions from the food cycle and how much is wasted by a simple box of strawberries not being used, or by your ability to physically buy more plastic. Think about not buying as much if you're able to. Um, and transportation, it's difficult for Oregon because we have honestly a very poor public transportation system depending on where we are. But if you can carpool, think about it and things like that. But these are all very tangible um, things that you as a person 
in addition to your other powers could really make a difference on a personal level. So with that, I am spot on for timing, which is sweet because I had not practiced that prior. So thank you guys for your patience. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it back to our moderator to help with some questions. Okay, thanks so much, Charlotte. Uh, really uh, enjoyable, especially I like the optimistic outlook you have on a what you consider a dire strait. Um, I will start out with, there's a couple questions in the chat. And if people, I think your way, hand raise is under participants. If you wanna raise your hand, I'll call on people and you can unmute as I call you to ask questions. So starting out in the chat, uh, there's a question, what are pteropods? Uh, excellent question. So pteropods, um, common name for them are sea butterflies. And basically what they are are pelagic or um, snails that float through the water. So instead of having the traditional foot or that slimy bit that sticks to the ground, they've actually evolved to have them up almost like uh, elephant wings or elephant ears that flap through the water and their shells on the bottom and they move around. So basically floating snails through the ocean is a very simplified definition that might make some biologists cringe, but it's what they are. Thank you. Um, keep in mind, uh, people in the audience, you can raise your hand to ask a question. Uh, there was a question in chat, what makes Northern Oregon coast more susceptible to hypoxia as compared to other areas along the West Coast? Uh, so that's a good question. So interestingly enough, Northern Oregon is not always actually as prone to hypoxia as Southern Oregon. Northern Oregon tends to get hit a little bit more by ocean acidification. And I might have skimmed through that a little bit more um, faster than I should have. So it really all has to do with where coastal upwelling is hitting the coast. And really that kind of mid-level of Oregon um, is that kind of sweet spot of where upwelling goes up and down. So when that coastal upwelling hits the coast, that usually is where the hypoxic zones occur. That said, further up on the coast, um, where Northern Oregon is tends to also be hit quite a bit by ocean acidification, not only from that upwelling in our currents, but also by changes within the Columbia River. So that fresh water input, um, obviously fresh water is neutral compared to the pH of the ocean. And when we have a larger fresh water input that really impacts our ocean acidification conditions because it drops the pH more than you would expect. And freshwater input is a direct impact of climate change, changes in precipitation, runoff, things like that. So hopefully I did answer that. I think I might've gone a little bit too much into the science realm though. Another question, uh, sources of sediment from land, uh, clear cut logging, runoff, you mentioned erosion. Uh, how does that influence uh, regional, local hypoxia and acidification? So that's an excellent question. And I am not a geochemist, so I'm going to use the best knowledge I can to answer that. But there's a few different factors. First of all, sediment tends to have um, inorganic carbon and organic carbon in it. Basically, it has bro broken down living stuff that is nutrients and kind of dead plants and animals. That really will break down once it hits the water by bacteria. And that breaking down absorbs oxygen so it kind of sucks up the oxygen in the water. So that's one of the impacts that it has on hypoxia itself in that cycle. But also that extra in that change in carbon source really does impact that really fancy graph that I showed earlier of kind of the um, carbon dioxide absorbing into the ocean water and kind of going through the series of bicarbonate chemistry. And those changes in carbon sources really kind of push the balance of different carbon within the ocean and that can also impact ocean acidification levels and in and of itself and that balance of how and when bicarbonate, which is the building blocks of shells, um, absorb or don't absorb in the saturation. Uh, that's aside from any sort of other pollutants that could be in the soil itself that will impact things. I think you've sparked some interest in uh, pteropods. <laughs> Another question. Why are pteropods important for hypoxia? What, what do they, what role? So, pteropods and hypoxia are curious because we don't know very much about the balance between 
pteropods and hypoxia, but we do know a huge balance between pteropods and ocean acidification. So pteropod shells are beautifully thin. They're almost like glass. Um, and they dissolve very, very rapidly. So they are one of the first organisms that we know that tends to be impacted by ocean acidification. Um, we do know that usually pteropods aren't around when there's hypoxic zones. We don't know if that's a really good correlation or if that's just a change in the currents. But pteropods, once again, are one of the direct food sources for many salmon. So if we know pteropods are affected by upwelling, by acidification, and they're dissolving, that will have a huge impact to salmon and the rest of the food chain. Uh, another question out of the chat. Um, you mentioned some impacts to our fisheries, and one trend that's happening is the market squid uh, is seeing a growing uh, fishery here in Oregon along the coast. Um, is this shift in distribution and is it related in any way to acidification or hypoxia? So that's an excellent question and one that I do not know very much about and honestly the researchers don't either. So there are natural boom and busts of different organisms based on changes in the ocean um, and that has to do with um, ENSO, um, Pacific Pacific decadal oscillation, basically changing natural patterns and current patterns. Um, but also there is just um, obviously climate change and the climate change is impacting um, phytoplankton or small plants in the ocean, zooplankton, small animals in the ocean. Those are really the crux of the food web and really some of the food sources for what the um, squid are feeding on. So a long story short, um, we know squid are impacted by water temperature and water temperature is one of those three pillars that I talked about in the first slide of ocean change. Do we know if squid are being impacted directly by hypoxia and or ocean acidification? We're not that sure. We do know that squid are not as sensitive to hypoxia as other organisms. So they might be necessarily just benefiting from the absence of other organisms. So are coming to areas where they normally wouldn't necessarily be able to compete. But the correlation's not there yet. Okay, another question out of the chat. Um, many of us remember the blob. Um, is this part of the acidification or something that's uh, another consideration that needs to be taken into account in some type of synergy. And I'll add to that question, uh, are we likely to see more blobs? Um, that's an excellent question. So the blob, um, I love the researcher that named it for, out of University of Washington. Um, the blob necessarily is more referencing um, ocean temperature. And once again, ocean temperature impacts ocean acidification hypoxia. They all fed from um, carbon dioxide and that increase there. Um, the blob in and of itself was lightly correlated. So basically when I use the word correlated, I'm basically using science jargon. It's basically there is science that in data that shows they are related. Um, it was the blob was related to some hypoxic conditions, but not a ton, not necessarily everywhere. Um, and there wasn't a clear pattern or relationship with ocean acidification, but the blob was very clearly an impact of temperature and changes in our climate. So do we need to watch for the blob? Absolutely. These are tied connections going back to what humans are doing with our carbon and with our carbon dioxide. Are we expected to see more of them? I am not a researcher in that field, but my gut says yes. We have seen more of them in various degrees. So um, it wouldn't shock me if this becomes a little bit more common than just the one-time occurrence. And honestly, it hasn't been just one time. It's occurred twice now in pretty substantial levels of what would be classified as the blob. Thank you. Uh, you showed some one pages in a slide, and as to other information, does uh, um, OAH Council have a web presence where people could get more information? Yes, we do. Um, it is not the most user friendly. Um, it needs to be updated, but we do have a web presence. It's on Oregon Ocean Info. 
Um, and I'm happy to share that final slide and actually all my slides with this group if you're interested in them. And um, then all of our information are, you can download our graphics. And also if you are um, graphic savvy, we can provide you with the editable versions. Um, all of our graphics are public. Well, I'll throw a question out there. Um, in S, do we see estuaries, do they tend to magnify or diminish acidification effects? So that's a great question. And the short answer to that is it depends on the estuary. So estuaries um, either tend to be very freshwater input um, through strong river streams. They tend to be very um, ocean input where they have a very good connection back and forth to the ocean or they tend to be somewhere in between. And dependent on where in that spectrum or the flushing of that estuary really depends on ocean acidification impacts there. More fresh water tends to be more dynamic. A lower kind of lip into that estuary with stronger upwelling, depending on where the coast is, once again, more ocean acidification. But if they tend to have a very slow sloshing effect through them with a lot of plant life with them, within them, which obviously with photosynthesis increases some of the oxygen and takes up carbon dioxide, um, that does mitigate some ocean acidification. So the long and the short is every estuary is different. It's more complicated than you think. And we got a time for a couple more questions. There's another question in chat. Um, could you walk us through again how carbon dioxide leads to a decrease in dissolved oxygen? That is an excellent question. And I am happy to walk through that. It is a little bit, it's not as clear cut as ocean acidification. Um, and I think that's probably where the question came up and that the audience member is really kind of thinking about that. So ocean hypoxia really is a manifestation of a few things. The easiest way to describe that is that more carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere really changes temperatures and ocean currents and things like that. So basically more atmospheric carbon dioxide, warmer the uh, air changes and warms up the ocean, changing basically the weather patterns of the ocean and also the currents of the ocean. Those changes of weather patterns and currents change that coastal upwelling or how much that water moves and how it moves. And it's important to think about that is that water that as it moves around the globe goes from surface to deep to surface to deep, depending on where it is. And the longer time it's on the bottom of the ocean, the less oxygen it is in there because it just basically organisms use up the oxygen. So the change in carbon dioxide changes how much that upwelling or the slashing up our coast occurs. So you not only have older water, that's been on the bottom longer, but you have more older water coming up on our coast because of the temperature change. And that's where the hypoxic aspect of this conversation comes in. So we're getting more old water on our coast and further into our coast because our wind is stronger and shoving it onto the coast more. Kind of adding that in with the concept of um, phytoplankton so that old water has lots of nutrients in it. It blooms like crazy on the coast, increasing what's there and then making that die and sink down more oxygen. So the long and the short, it's not clear cut like ocean acidification, but it really is carbon dioxide changes temperature, changes how the water moves and really impacts it that way. Oh, thank you so much. Well, we're just about at our time and uh, I think we're out of questions in the chat. So um, I know I appreciate uh, you coming to share with us and I think everybody, uh, you can't hear the loud applause on Zoom. We do have uh, maybe one raised hand question here. Uh, or may, oh, that's a clap, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, one last question in chat, uh, then we'll close it out. Um, so well, upwell, has upwelling increased over the last decades? Um, that's a very hard question to ask, answer, but the long and the short of it is that its intensity and duration has, not necessarily its overall like amount of it. 
So when it occurs and how strong it occurs is changing. And that's why we're seeing stronger, longer hypoxic seasons closer to the Oregon shore. And I am not a physical oceanographer. So that is why I'm going to give you the uh, biologist's answer to that. You, you have the wrong white field for the oceanography question. My husband is an oceanographer. Well, thank you so much, Charlotte. Uh, it's been really in, informative and enjoyable. Um, and thank all of the audience for participating. Uh, as I mentioned, this is recorded and we'll be sending out an email with a web link to this. Um, any closing comments, Charlotte? No, thank you so much for my, uh, allowing me to come and give a presentation. And hopefully I didn't talk too fast. As I said, I didn't have much time to prep. So I'm hoping this was informative. Very much so. Thank you. Great. And have a great evening, everyone. Good night, all.